Welcome to this section on elastic load balancing and auto scaling groups. This is a section where we really see the power of the AWS cloud and the cloud in general and see how these new paradigms we saw really help us shine and make our applications scale seamlessly. So let's discuss the concept of scalability and high availability. So if your application can scale, that means that it can handle greater loads by adapting. And there are two kinds of scalability in the cloud. There is vertical scalability and horizontal scalability, also called elasticity. So the scalability is going to be linked but different to high availability. And these things are going to be discussed in this lecture. So let's do a deep dive. And we'll be using a call center as an example. So imagine we have a call center and we just receive calls. Now let's see what it means to be scalable in that case. So first, let's deal with vertical scalability. In AWS, when you are vertically scalable, that means that you can increase the size of the instance. So for our call center, say we have a junior operator, and say we were able to upgrade that operator, we would get a senior operator. And for example, the senior operator can handle a lot more calls than the junior operator because it's more experienced. So this would be what vertical scalability looks like in a call center, if we could upgrade, obviously, a junior operator into a senior operator. So in AWS, for example, say your application runs on the T2 Micro, and to do a vertical scalability for that application, that means that now we run our application on a T2 large. So we've changed the size of our EC2 instance. And vertical scalability is very common when you have a non-distributed system, for example, a database. If you want to give more performance to your database, you would just increase the size of your database. But usually with vertical scalability, there is a limit to how much you can vertically scale, and that is a limit of the hardware, even though nowadays these limits can be very, very, very high, okay? Next is horizontal scalability. So that means that now, instead of increasing the size of your EC2 instance, you increase the number of instances or systems for your application. So back into our call center example, we have an operator, and we want to do horizontal scalability for that operator, that means we will add another operator. And if we need to handle more calls, we will add another operator and so on. So maybe we can scale horizontally from one operator all the way to six operators. So when you have horizontal scaling, that implies, as you can see on the right hand side, that you need to have a distributed system. And for a call center, that makes sense. You don't need these people to be talking constantly. For a call center, each of the individual operators can take calls on their own in AWS or for web applications. So this is going to be very common. So if you have a web application or a modern application, you usually design it with horizontal scalability in mind. And it's super easy on AWS to scale thanks to Amazon EC2 and auto scaling groups. And we'll see this in this section. So now let's talk about high availability and it goes hand in hand with horizontal scaling. High availability means that you are running your application and system in at least two availability zones on AWS. But for our call center, what does it mean? That means that we have a call center in New York and maybe a second call center in San Francisco. And somehow, if one of these call centers is down, for example, say there is a power outage in New York, then we can still stake calls in San Francisco and so we are highly available. Obviously, San Francisco will be more busy, but we are at least surviving the disaster of a power outage in one of our buildings. So in AWS, you use two availability zones, obviously. And the goal of it is to usually survive a data center loss, a disaster. And in AWS, there could be an earthquake, there could be a power outage, there could be a lot of things. Okay, so to summarize, high availability and scalability for EC2. If we have vertical scaling, that means that we're increasing the instance size. So we can scale up if we're increasing it or scale down if you're decreasing it. So we can go all the way from a T2 nano of 0.5 gigabytes of RAM and one vCPU all the way to, and obviously that can change over time, a U12 TB1 dot metal, which is a very scary name, but has 12.3 terabytes of RAM and 448 vCPUs. That is for vertical scalability. Now for horizontal, this is when you increase the number of instances, it's called scaling out, or when you decrease the number of instances, it's called scaling in. And for this, we'll be using an auto scaling group and a load balancer. This is the topic of this section. And then when we have high availability, that means that we run the instances of the same application across multiple availability zones. And this will be again leveraged by an auto scaling group in multi-AZ mode. 
and a load balancer in multi-AZ. One last word. So the exam will ask you to figure out, is this scalability? Is it elasticity? Is it agility? And so I just want to give you some formal definitions. So to summarize, scalability is the ability for a system to accommodate a larger load by making the hardware stronger, okay, scaling up, or by adding nodes, scaling out. This is when your application can scale. Now, elasticity is something a bit more cloud native. This is once a system is actually scalable, so you can either scale it up or scale it out. Elasticity means that there will be some sort of auto scaling in it so that the system can scale based on the load that it's receiving. And in this case, we're going to pay per use. We're going to match the demand we're receiving with the number of servers. And obviously we're going to pay just the right amount. So we will optimize cost. So in AWS, elasticity is a key concept. And agility is absolutely not related to scalability or elasticity. This is a distractor, but just to remember, remind you what it means, agility means that the new IT resources are only a click away, which means that you can reduce the time to make these resources available to your developers from weeks to just minutes. And so your organization is more agile, it can iterate more quickly, and you are going faster. Okay, so that's it for this section introduction. I hope you liked it, and I will see you in the next lecture. So let's see the first service that will allow us to be more elastic on AWS. This is called Elastic Load Balancing. So a load balancer is a server that will forward the internet traffic down to multiple servers downstream, and for them, there will be EC2 instances. They're also called the backend EC2 instances. So Elastic Load Balancing is something that is managed by AWS. So we have a load balancer, and this is what we will be publicly exposing for our users. And behind that load balancer, we will have multiple EC2 instances, maybe three in that case. And then we have our first user talking to our load balancer, okay? And the load balancer will be directing the traffic to one of these EC2 instances. And the EC2 instance will reply back with something and the user will get the response. But now if a second user comes in, then we will get the reply from another EC2 instance and if a third user comes in, as you can expect, it will be replying from another EC2 instance. And so the load balancer, the more users we have, the more it will balance the load across multiple EC2 instances, and that will allow us to scale better our backends. So why would you use one? I think it's clear. You can spread the load across multiple downstream instances. You can expose a single point of access, a DNS host name for your application. You can seamlessly handle the failures of downstream instances. So we do regular health checks on them. And if one of them is failing, then the load balancer will not direct traffic to that instance. So we can hide the failure of an EC2 instance using a load balancer. We can also provide SSL termination, so HTTPS for your websites very easily. And you are able to use a load balancer across multiple availability zones, which was making your application highly available. Okay, let's keep on going. So the ELB is a managed load balancer, so you don't need to be provisioning servers. AWS will do it for you. And AWS will guarantee that it will be working. AWS will take care of all the upgrades, maintenance, and high availability of that Elastic Load Balancer. And the only thing we have to do is to configure a few things for the behavior of that load balancer. It's obviously less expensive if you want to set up your own load balancer on EC2, it is def definitely possible, but in the end, it will be a lot more effort on your end for maintenance, integration, maintaining and taking care of the operating system upgrades, etc., etc. So there are four kinds of load balancers offered by AWS, and you need to know the differences between them. So the first one is the application load balancer, which is for HTTP or HTTPS only traffic, which is called a layer seven type of load balancer because it's HTTP and HTTPS. Next, we have the network load balancer. It's ultra high performance, so look for that keyword. It allows for TCP and UDP actually, and it's layer four. So it's layer four because it's lower level, so it's TCP and UDP. Then we have the gateway load balancer. It's layer three, I will show you the differences in the next slide. And then finally, we have the classic load balancer, but it's being retired in 2023. So it's not going to appear at the exam anymore, I feel. But if you want to know, it was a layer four and layer seven type of load balancer of older generation. And it's been replaced by the ALB, the application balancer, and the NLB, the network load balancer. 
So if we have a look at the differences between the ALB, the NLB, and the Gateway Load Balancer, also GWLB, then what you need to look at for the exam are these kind of keywords. So if you see HTTP, HTTPS, or GRPC protocol, it means it's layer 7, and it's the ALB. Also, any kind, anytime you need HTTP routing features, this will be requested. For a static DNS as well, this would be very helpful if you want to have a static URL. So the architecture is very simple. The users access your load balancers on one of the protocols I just mentioned, and then the load balancer routes traffic to the downstream EC2 instances, for example, if you've chosen the targets to be EC2 instances. For the network load balancer, it is layer 4, so TCP and UDP protocol. And it's very high performance. We're talking millions of requests per second. It gives you a static IP this time, so not a static URL, but a static IP, through the use of elastic IP, which are IPs that you own and that you can move around. So this NLB gives you a static IP, and the architecture is the exact same as the ALB. The traffic is being sent to the NLB on the TCP and UDP protocol, and then sent forwarded to downstream targets, for example, EC2 instances. Now, the gateway load balancer is using the Geneve protocol on the IP packets themselves, so it's layer 3. And the use case you need to look at for the exam is to route traffic to firewalls that you manage on EC2 instances so that you can do, for example, classic firewall or intrusion detection or deep packet inspection. And the architecture it is a little bit more complicated. So the gateway load balancer doesn't balance the load to your application. It actually balances the load of the traffic to the virtual appliances that you run on EC2 instances so that you can analyze the traffic or perform firewall operations. That's why it's called third-party security virtual appliances. And there can be many of them. I just represented one on this diagram. And so therefore, the traffic, when it goes to the gateway load balancer, first sends the traffic to these EC2 instances that will analyze the traffic. The traffic will be sent back afterwards to the gateway load balancer and then forwarded back to the applications. So the gateway load balancer here is in the middle to allow us to inspect the IP packets themselves and to perform firewall features or intrusion detection or deep packet inspection. Okay, so if you understood this, you know the differences between the load balancers and you'll be good for the exam. And I will see you in the next lecture for some practice. So we're going to practice launching a load balancer, but first we need to send traffic to something. So first we're going to launch EC2 instances. So I'm going to go into launch instances and I will launch two instances. So on the right hand side, I can say two instances. And the name is going to be my first instance. We'll rename the second one when it comes to it. We're going to use Amazon Linux 2 on this architecture. We're going to use a T2 micro. And then we are going to proceed without a key pair because we don't need SSH capability. We can use EC2 Instance Connect if we ever need to. Then for network settings, we can select an existing security group. And we will use the Launch Wizard 1 security group, which allowed us to do HTTP traffic and SSH traffic into our EC2 instance. So that's perfect. We're going to use the basic storage. And for advanced details, I will scroll down and I will add some EC2 user data. And to do so, I'm going to copy what I have here and paste it here. So this will just launch the EC2 instance the same way we've launched them before using this EC2 user data script. So let's launch our two instances. And now we're going to view all instances. So I'm going to rename the second one my second instance and save. So let's wait for these instances to be ready. So my EC2 instances are now ready. I'm going to copy the first IPv4 address and paste it. And I will visit the URL. And as you can see, I get a hello world from my instance. So this is great. And then I can go to my second instance right here. I will copy again the IPv4 and then paste it, press enter, and I get a hello world again. So as you can see, two instances give us two hello worlds, and the last part is changing. And so what we'd like to do is to have only one URL to access these two EC2 instances and balance the load between them. 
So for this, of course, we're going to use a load balancer. So let's scroll down and look at load balancers. And here you can create a load balancer. So we have different load balancer types. And in this demo, we're going to only look at the application load balancer. But you need to understand the difference between the ALB, the network load balancer, and the gateway load balancer. So for the application load balancer, as you can see here, it is for HTTP and HTTPS kind of traffic. For the network load balancer, it's going to be on the TCP and UDP protocol, or TLS over TCP. And this is something you're going to use when you need ultra high performance. That means millions of requests per second while maintaining ultra low latency. So this is a very high performance load balancer, this one. And then finally, the gateway load balancer right here, as you can see, it's used for security, for intrusion detection, for firewalls, and so on. So it's to analyze the network traffic. When it goes to the classic load balancer, by the time you watch this video, this may be gone because the classic load balancer is going away. And so therefore, I'm not going to discuss it and touch it. OK, so let's focus on creating the application load balancer. So I'm going to call this one Demo ALB. And if you wanted to read about how load balancing works, you can read it here. But hopefully, the previous lecture was enough for you. So the scheme is internet facing, and the address type is IPv4. For network mapping, we, we need to decide where to deploy the load balancer and how many availability zones. So let's deploy it in all of them. Great. And then we need to assign a security group to our load balancer. So it turns out that I'm going to create a new security group for it. And we need to only allow HTTP traffic. So I'll call it demo SG load balancer. Allow HTTP into load balancer, into ALB. And the inbound rules is going to allow all HTTP on from anywhere. OK. And the outbound rules are fine. Let's create this security group. So it is now created. And I can go back in here, refresh this page, choose my demo SG load balancer, and remove the default security group so that I'm only left with one security group. So let's scroll down. And we are under listeners and routing. And so we need to route the traffic from HTTP on port 80 to a target group. And a target group is nothing more than a group of my EC2 instances that were created. So for this, we need to create a target group. So let's click here to create one. And the basic configuration tells us that we want to group instances together. But as you can see, you have other options. But we want to group instances together. And I'll call this one demo TGALB. The protocol is HTTP on port 80. You have different options, but based on the option you choose, is going to be a target group for a different kind of load balancer. So we'll keep it as HTTP on port 80. The version of HTTP is 1, so we'll keep it as 1. The health check is good. And then let's click on Next. And then we need to register our targets. So we're going to register both EC2 instances on port 80. And let's include them as pending below. So now my instances are registered. And let's create this target group. So it's created. And now I need to refresh my page. And actually, I had created one before. So the one I want to use is demo TG ALB. So this target group is created. And it's linked to the listener on my load balancer on port 80. So now I'm good to go. And I can go ahead and create my load balancer. So I'm going to click on View Load Balancer. And I'm back into this page where I can have a look at my load balancer. And right now, it is in the provisioning space. So we need to wait until it is provisioned. So my ALB is now active. It's ready. And as you can see, there's a DNS name available for me. So I'm going to copy this, paste it in a new tab. And through the application load balancer, I'm able to get a Hello World. But the cool thing about it is that if I refresh this page and keep on refreshing it, then as you can see, the target is changing. That's because my application load balancer is actually redirecting between both my EC2 instances which is very cool. And that's the proof that load balancing is actually happening. How do we know? Well, if we go to our target group, this one, and we look at the targets of my target group, as we can see, they're both healthy. That means that the application balancer through the target group is going to send traffic to both of them one after the other. 
And the target, the target group is very smart because if I take my first instance, for example, and I stop it, through this, what we're doing is that we're stopping our two instance, and so therefore it's going to be unhealthy because it cannot respond anymore to the traffic coming in. And so if I go in my target group, maybe I'm too fast, let's see, and refresh, so I will wait about 30 seconds. And now, as you can see, the first instance is unused because it's in stop state. And so therefore, if I go back to my application load balancer and refresh, the only response I'm getting for this instance is that one instance that is still up and running. This is the power of using load balancers because they know when the targets are healthy or not healthy. And so this instance is stopped, but of course, if I recover it, if I start it again, then it's going to boot up and it's going to create the service behind the scenes. And so let's wait for the instance to be started and hopefully we'll see it again as being healthy in our target group. The instance is now up and we are in the initial health status, as you can see, and now we are in a healthy status. So the instance was deemed healthy. And so therefore, if I go back to my application balancer and refresh, as you can see now, the hello world is coming from both instances. So that's it. We've practiced low balancer. We created one as well as two targets in the target group. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next lecture. Okay, so now we have an application that can be load balanced through a load balancer. But how do we create automatically these servers in the backend? For this, we can use an auto scaling group. So why? Well, in real life, your load on the websites can change over time. So for example, say your users are doing shopping, they're most likely doing shopping during the day and not at night. So you expect more load during the day and less load during the night. So in the cloud, we know we can create and get rid of servers very quickly. And so the goal of an auto scaling group is to scale out. That means add EC2 instances to match an increased load or scale in. That means remove EC2 instances to match a decreased load. With this, we can ensure that we have also as well a minimum and a maximum number of machines running at any point of time. And once the autoscaling group does create or remove EC2 instances, we can make sure that these instances will be registered or deregistered into our load balancer. So these two things work hand in hand. Finally, in case one of our servers becomes unhealthy, maybe there's an application bug, then the autoscaling group can detect it and say, yeah, you know what? I don't need an unhealthy instance. I'm going to deregister it. I'm going to terminate it and replace it by a new healthy one. So with an autoscaling group, we get a lot of benefits. And another benefit we get is that we have huge cost savings because we are only running all the time at the optimal capacity. And that is one of the guiding principle of the cloud. Elasticity. So. If we look at our autoscaling group in AWS, this is it. We have a minimum size, maybe it's one EC2 instance. Then there is a setting called the desired capacity, which is also usually the actual size of your autoscaling group. And then finally, you can define a maximum size of your autoscaling group. And automatically, your ASG, autoscaling group, can scale out as needed or scale in as needed by adding EC2 instances over time. And it works hand in hand with a load balancer. So that means that if we have our auto scaling group, for example, with one EC2 instance, web traffic can be coming in through our load balancer, which will be redirecting the traffic directly into your EC2 instance. And as our auto scaling group scales out by adding EC2 instances, the load balancer will have them registered and will send traffic to them as well. So as we add on more and more EC2 instances, the load balancer distributes more and more of the traffic all the way to the maximum size of your auto scaling group if it scales all that point. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will be reproducing that very same setup with an auto scaling group, multiple EC2 instances, and a load balancer. So I hope that was helpful, and I will see you in the next lecture. So before we go ahead and practice creating an auto scaling group, you need to take your first two instances, and we're actually going to terminate them. Okay, so now that this is done, we can go ahead and create an auto scaling group. For this, on the bottom left, click on auto scaling group and we will create an auto scaling group. So I'm going to call this one demo ASG and we need to create a launch template. So currently we have none. So let's create a launch template. 
and I will call this one demo launch template. And this template is being used to tell to the ASG how to create EC2 instances within it. So this will look very, very similar to what we have when we create EC2 instances. As you can see here, I can choose, for example, a quick start Amazon Linux for getting Amazon Linux 2 as the base of my EC2 instance. Then we have an instance type that we can include, for example, T2 Micro. For key pair, we will not include it in the launch templates, or we can just say that, no, we don't need one, so this is good enough. For subnets, so we'll not include this in the launch templates. For security group, we can select a security group that's already existing. For example, my launch wizard one. Under advanced network configuration, we don't need to do anything. For EBS volumes for storage, we don't need to do anything. And then for advanced details, we want these instances to start with some user data. And so we scroll all the way down. And here we copy and paste the user data. OK, so let's create this launch template. As you can see, thanks to this launch template, we launch EC2 instances just like before. So let's refresh this and then click on the demo launch template of version 1. So here it describes what is going to happen, the type of instance we're going to have, the security groups, and so on. So let's click on Next. Next, we need to choose where to launch these instances. So we have our VPC, and then we can select multiple availability zones and subnets. So we select three of them. And for instance type requirements, we can use the one from the launch template, or if you wanted to, override them. But we don't need to, actually. So let's click on Next. Next, we have load balancers. So we want to attach to an existing load balancer. And this is going to be a application balancer. And to do this, we're going to tell the ASG, the auto scaling group, that every instance created should be registered within my demo target group for my ALB. So therefore, all these instances will be under the target group. And then the load balancer will be able to direct traffic to them. So the health check can be EC2 and also ELB. So we're good. And then we can click on Next. Now here comes the scaling of the auto scaling group. So the desired capacity is how many instances you want at any time. For example, we want two EC2 instances to have some sort of load balancing. The minimum capacity is one, meaning we want at least one instance. And the maximum is four. That means we want at most four instances. But the desired is what matters the most because this is the actual capacity that we're going to get. OK. So then do we want scaling policies? This is too advanced, but you, of course, can set scaling policies on a auto scaling group. That's the whole point of it, which allows you to, re, uh, to resize your ASG on demand. If there is much more demand, then it's going to have more instances. If there is less request, less demand, then it's going to be less instances. So click on Next. Next, we don't need notifications. We don't need tags. We can review everything. It looks good. And let's create our auto scaling group. So now our auto scaling group is being created. And as you can see, the state is updating capacity because we have zero instances in our ASG, but we want to. So I can click on it to get a bit more details. So let's go under activity. And in here, we have two activity history. That is, we are launching two new EC2 instances because, well, the desired capacity went from zero to two. And so if we have a look under the instance management tab, as you can see now, two EC2 instances are in the pending state. So if I go under EC2 and look at my EC2 instances in that UI, we also see that two instances are running and these have been created by my auto scaling group. So the benefit is that now they are fully managed by my auto scaling group. And let's go see, for example, in my target group as well. So if I go to my target group on the left-hand side and look at my demo TG ALB right here, scroll down. As you can see, now we have two total targets. And these are the targets created by our auto scanning group. So again, thanks to the integration that we've defined between the auto scanning group and the load balancer, we are able to have automatically these new EC2 instances registered as targets in our target group. So currently, they're unhealthy. This is because the instance hasn't started all the way yet. So let's wait a little bit until they become healthy. So to speed up the check from unhealthy to healthy, you can go under health checks of your target group. And here, you can edit the settings. 
And under advanced settings, we can say that the healthy threshold is going to be two and the interval is going to be five seconds. This is going to make the uh, thing much quicker. So of course the timeout needs to be two seconds, something less than the interval itself. So let's save our changes. And now the health check change, uh, settings have changed. And so if I go back into my targets and refresh, now both my instances are healthy. We just made the health check happen faster and more often. So now both my instances are healthy. And so therefore, if I go under my load balancer right here, and I look at the DNS name and open it in a new tab, I get a hello world from both my instances. And this is cool because these two instances were created by the auto-scanning group. So because now we have an auto-scanning group, we can actually do some cool stuff. So if we take one of these instances, for example, and we can, for example, terminate it. So I'm going to click on it. And I'm under the instance itself. I will do instance state and then terminate instance. Now it's been successfully terminated. So what's going to happen is that because this instance is being shutting down and terminated, well, my autoscaling group is going to detect that guess what? One of these instances is not in service anymore. It's being terminated. And so therefore, because we have an autoscaling group with a desired capacity of two instances, automatically a new instance should appear. So let's observe this behavior by having here the activity history. And as you can see, in progress was terminating EC2 instance. And so an instance was taken out of service because, well, it's been terminated. And then we have a new activity saying, hey, an instance was launched in response to an unhealthy instance needing to be replaced. So it's very cool because the autoscan group can automatically detect unhealthy instances and create new one for replacements. So if we go here now, there's one instance in pending state, which is being started, one instance being terminated, and one instance in service. And this is the whole power of auto-scanning groups. Of course, you can go to the next level, but for now we know enough, which is around automatic scaling, to actually define scaling policies to automatically increase or decrease the desired capacity over time based on our load and so on. But here, you've seen the basics and the major features of auto-scaling groups. And you could play around by editing the desired capacity yourself to set it to one, for example, to terminate instances and only keep one of them, or to set it to four and see the auto-scaling group create multiple instances that will be registered with our load balancer. And so therefore, the traffic is going to be distributed between four instances. So I hope you liked it, and I will see you in the next lecture. Okay, so we've seen how auto-scaling group works, but let's have a look at the different scaling strategy for your auto-scaling groups. So the first one is to do manual scaling, which is when we update the size of our auto-scaling group manually. And this is when, for example, we change the desired capacity from one to two or back from two to one. Then we can define some scaling strategies such as dynamic scaling to respond to changing demand automatically. So we have different type of scaling policies within dynamic scaling. We have the simple and the step scaling, which is the idea is that whenever a CloudWatch alarm is triggered, for example, you say whenever the average CPU utilization of all my EC2 instance goes over 70% for five minutes, then add two units of capacity to my ASG. Or when another alarm, for example, say whenever the CPU utilization is less than 30% for 10 minutes, then remove one unit of capacity in my ASG. This would be simple or step scaling because we define the trigger and then we define how many units we add or remove. Then we have target tracking scaling, which is a very easy way of defining a scaling policy. The example is to say, hey, I want the average CPU utilization of all the EC2 instances in my ASG to stay at around 40% on average. And then the ASG will scale automatically to make sure that you stay around that target of 40%. And we have also schedule scaling. So this is when we know that changes are going to happen ahead of time. So we anticipate a scaling based on known users pattern. And for example, we're saying, hey, we know that on Friday at 5 p.m., people are going to do sports betting, maybe, who knows, before the, before the soccer game. And so please increase the minimum capacity to 10 EC2 instances in my ASG at 5 p.m. on Friday. This could be a scheduled scaling. 
And there's one last type of scaling that is uh, definitely appearing at the exam, which is called predictive scaling. So this one uses machine learning to predict future traffic ahead of time. So there are some algorithms that will look at the past traffic patterns and it will forecast what will happen to traffic based on the past uh, patterns. And so the idea is that it's called predictive because we predict what the load will be over time and maybe the load is just on a daily basis it peaks for three hours so this is the kind of things that predictive scaling will pick up okay and it will automatically provision the right number of ec2 instances in advance to match that predicted uh, period so this is what the graphs you see on the right hand side this is very helpful when you have time-based patterns and you just want to have an easy, uh, um, um, without any inter intervention type of scaling strategies that is powered by machine learning, then that would be predictive scaling. So that's it for this lecture. I hope you liked it and remember the strategies. I will see you in the next lecture. So we are going to clean up our instances and so on. But if you try to go in instances and actually terminate these two instances, this will not work because if you do so, then the autoscaling group will recreate them. So the strategy here is to actually go under the autoscaling group and we're going to delete the autoscaling group altogether. So just type delete in here to confirm the deletion of it. And then the next thing we have to delete is the load balancer. So find your application balancer, action, and then delete. Confirm to agree and you're good to go. And finally, you may be wondering, well, should I delete my target group? Well, we don't have to because the target group don't cost you any money. And that target group is going to be empty because we have deleted the autoscaling group and we have deleted the load balancer. And that's it. When the ASG is going to be gone, then your EC2 instances that your ASG manages will also be gone. So you'll be fully clean. So that's it. We will remain within the free tier for this course. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next lecture. Okay, so let's summarize the section on the ELB and the ASG. So first we discussed the concept of high availability, scalability would be vertical and horizontal, elasticity and agility in the cloud. It is very important for you to understand to which concept corresponds to which features. For example, high availability means that you are having your applications across multiple availability zones. Vertical scaling means that you are increasing the size of an instance and horizontal scaling that is that you are increasing the number of instances. Elasticity is the ability to scale up and down based on demand. And agility is a concept of the cloud that is going to be able to make you work faster because you can create and delete resources very, very quickly. Now our load balancers, our ELB, are allowing us to distribute traffic across backend EC2 instances and they can be spread out across multiple availability zones. We support health checks to make sure that the backend EC2 instances are indeed healthy. And we have four kinds of load balancers. The classic one is old and retired. We have the application load balancer for HTTP type of workload at the layer seven, network load balancer for very high performance and TCP level load balancing, layer four. And finally, the gateway load balancer, layer three, to root the network itself and make it go by, for example, through some virtual appliances. We have autoscaling groups that allow us to implement elasticity for our application, therefore spreading our load across multiple AZ and scaling accordingly. So we scale these EC2 instances based on the demand on your system, and we can replace unhealthy instances. There's a tight integration between the ASG and the ELB. So this is why they are a great combination. And together, we achieve high availability, scalability, elasticity, and agility in the cloud. All right, that's it. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next lecture.